Hi everybody, it's Tom Schaller here in Los Angeles with Otis, and thanks for joining me. I'm happy to paint for you today. I uh, just want to say a um, big hello to my whole Fabriano family, and a very special thanks to Anna for all her hard work and patience in pulling all this together. So thank you all very much. Now join me over at my easel. See you soon. Okay, hey guys. Um, well, I think these days, one thing I keep hearing from many of my painter friends is we can't travel as much as we used to, which is a shame, but we adapt and a good painter should be able to paint wherever they are with whatever they have to work with. So today I'm gonna to be um, confronting something I think we've all had to face in the last year or so. And you know, even before that and even after this passes and some kind of normal comes back. And that is the task that artists sometimes have of painting from a photograph. Uh, we all have to do it, I think. Um, from time to time, there are always reference photos that we have to use and it can be a benefit, but there are certain pitfalls that I want to discuss today. Um, so the theme, I guess, of my demonstration would be the artist's job of interpretation, interpreting what we see. Uh, today that's gonna be from a photograph, but it also holds true, I think, when we um, paint plein air or from real life uh, the visual information that we get as artists, I think, has to be interpreted, edited most often, boiled down to something um, better, hopefully, for a painting. Certainly different. The reality of what we look at, uh, either in real-world observation or in a photograph, is quite different than the reality of the painting that... Uh, will follow from that or is inspired by that. They are connected, but they are two different things altogether. So the artist should never feel the need to duplicate, copy, or imitate exactly what he or she sees, but rather use it as an opportunity to, again, interpret, um, make that your own using your own artistic voice. So anyway, today in my art, I'm going to be in New York City in Central Park and uh, painting one of these beautiful pavilions that are in the middle of the park. These are uh, Victorian from um, the last century and made out of rough hewn wood. And a theme of a lot of my work um, is contrast. And I don't just mean the contrast of light and dark, although I do mean that, but also of in the visual image of vertical versus horizontal imagery, diagonals as well, um, but also more thematically or in terms of narrative, the idea of the clash of the natural world and the man-made world, um, many other things too, but that's mostly what I'm gonna be tackling today. One of the beautiful, compelling things about Central Park, I think, is that it's this gorgeous rural oasis in the middle of an incredibly dense, busy, urban metropolis, New York City. And I like that contrast. It plays in very well to the themes that, that I like to address as an artist. So this was the original, one of the original reference photos I took. I did sketch this uh, a year or two ago on site, but I'm gonna sort of replicate that idea here in the studio today. So again, what I like is the contrast between this rough hewn organic uh, rural shapes against the more hard edged stone and steel and concrete uh, city looming behind. So that's one level of contrast. Um, the other pitfall I think we fall into or the probably the main pitfall that we can fall into when we look at a photo and we want to paint from it aside from the impulse to paint every little thing you see, is that a photograph has a way of flattening all the visual information so that um, the background becomes as important as the foreground. All the details in these distant buildings can distract us and pull our focus away from what we're really trying to paint. 
So what I always do, however I paint, however I approach the subject, I try to set up a hierarchy of what's important in my painting. The most important consideration is why am I painting this? What is my intent? What is the intention of this painting? What is it trying to say? It doesn't have to be a big important story, but I try very hard not to paint uh, things, people, places, or things, but I try to paint my reaction to them. I try to paint what that person, place, or thing is asking or saying to me, and then uh, transfer that, I hope, to the viewer. So here we have uh, this beautiful pavilion. I love the imagery and the story that this tells, the contrast between rural and urban, between light and dark. But I think the photograph, the real world observations, uh, need some design work, some interpretation to make it a more compelling photograph or um, painting. I usually take a black and white photo as well, or I strip the color out of my original so that I can study uh, in black and white the values. After intent, I think the most important thing to me about any painting is the composition, the placement of shapes on the paper, to get that to work, then it becomes a value composition. Your darks, how do you place your darks, your lights, and your midtones? Never can forget you're working on a flat, two-dimensional sheet of paper. We have only two dimensions to work with, height and width. So anything we can do, generally, to play up the sense of depth and dimensionality, I think is to the good. That's why I always do these little sketches for myself even if I think I know exactly where I'm gonna go. These sketches help give me a much more clear idea of the painting that will follow. They help pull me a little out of uh, this reality into the more, I think, interpretive, more emotive, more artistic reality of the painting to come. This also helps me teach myself where I want to save the light in my paintings. If you lose the light in your watercolor, you're usually in trouble. I organize all of my paintings pretty much, um, now I think consistently, in three basic values. The darkest darks, the lightest lights, and the rest of the painting in neutrals or mid-tones. So what I'm going to try to do is set my lights right here, which is quite different, you can see, from the actual photograph. Um, so I'm redesigning reality to make what I hope will be a better painting. So I'm going to illuminate from behind the park and the city and just let it vanish, dissolve into light behind. The darkest darks, I'm going to crowd around the lightest lights. So these trees that I'm adding a few trees here, some redesign, these beautiful diagonal banks of rocks I'm keeping, but I'm going to make a little bit more dramatic than they really are. And in terms of value, this will be number three. Dark, 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 the roof of the pavilion, and then light all behind. Almost always in your composition, where your lightest light meets your darkest dark, that's where the viewer's eye is going to go. The rest of the painting, the city behind, I'm going to ghost it out a little bit. I want it to be there, but look mysterious. The foreground of the painting, it will be there too, but it's less visually important. So I'm going to ghost it out a bit too and make these more number two, the mid-tones. So we'll have, I hope, a nice dialogue of dark here, a little bit of dark here to pull you right through on this path of light and dark on a diagonal through the painting. The horizon line where the, the people standing in the pavilion are is just uh, a little bit more than a third up from the bottom. Uh, the primary vertical will be here. And I think I'll have a pretty dynamic and comfortable composition in this way. But the major reading of darks and lights is going to be on this diagonal axis, secondarily here, and 
tertiary here. So yeah, it's pretty dynamic. I wanna to try to tell the story of the feeling you get when you walk up this, this rocky slope and stop for a nice shady rest under the pavilion. And again, it's not a big story, but that's what I'm gonna to try to do. When I do my paintings, I will use my little value sketch way more than I'll use the reference photos. I'll have these at hand if I think I need them. Often the reference photos, once this is done, will pull me out of the work and uh, make me slow down and start to paint uh, details a little bit more than I might want to. To respect the time, I've sketched this up beforehand a bit but I think I was pretty true to my, to my uh, value sketch. I use this to draw this, not the reference photos, believe it or not. I looked at them just to try to memorize some important details of the structure, but I also, if you really study this, we'll see this isn't really a faithful replication of what that is. It's sort of a, again, an interpretation, an idea of it rather than a duplication. I've done some redesign there as well. So I'll keep this, my study, off to the side because that's my value blueprint. And um, start it. Generally speaking, um, the lightest lights are already there on the surface of the paper. So I, generally speaking, work on my paintings from light to dark, and the darkest elements come in last. It's not a rule or always the case, but very often um, my darkest darks might tend to be uh, the elements that have harder edges, and my lighter midtones might have softer edges. That's another way to emphasize uh, depth and perspective in, in a work, too. Things with softer wet and wet edges tend to look a little farther away than uh, the elements that have harder edges tend to look a little more close. There are thousands of uh, exceptions to that, so it's not a rule. It's just one way you can go about organizing the values in your painting. I've turned my painting upside down, as you can see, and I'm working with a big, flat, uh, all natural brush to quickly sort of carve in some initial um, mid-tones. I'm going to use a combination of um, yellows and violets for the buildings. This is a Naples yellow. I'm not being very careful because, uh, again, I really tend, or I try my very best to make my paintings about shapes, shapes of light, dark, and tones rather than about objects. Um, there, there's a time for being specific and accurate in depiction, but more often than not in a watercolor, or maybe in painting in general, I don't know, it depends on how you paint. But it's the shapes, it's the values that are far more important than any kind of accuracy in terms of detail. So again, I'm um, not being very careful. I'm just carving in some mid-tones. I'm always saying this, but it's true. In watercolor, it's um, true to say, I think, that it's a subtractive medium. And by that, I mean you start with the blank white sheet of paper, 100% light. And then you subtract away some of that light by painting in the shades and shadows. People ask me often, how do you paint light in your watercolor? And of course the answer is, I don't. The white, the light is already painted. What I paint are the shades and the shadows. And so for that reason, I think the watercolorist has to pay special attention to the areas of dark in their work 
because that's all we paint. And so it's important to make uh, the dark areas of your painting as vibrant or as luminous or as communicative as you can because that's what gives the light its life and its purpose. I flip the painting back as you can see and now uh, as this begins to set with the very um, kind of washed out tones of violet and little bits of cobalt blue I'm just carving in some of these shapes of the city behind. I don't want hard edges back here because I want this to look mysterious, fuzzy, if you will, and far away. So as this dries more, I will put a little bit more identity and tonality on here, but not a lot more. I want to just paint these in pretty wet and wet so that they look, you know, very distant, very far away. I'm always cognizant that I'm working on a flat sheet of paper. Everything we can do to make three dimensions look real is magic to me because it is. It's a magic trick. Um, but it's, it's fun. It's fun to try to do that. The, the illusion of depth and perspective, which is really all it is, is a very fun thing to try to achieve. I really love very textured paper. Um, I think in combination with very wet sediment-based pigments, which I also prefer, you get a lot of this opportunity for these scrapey, scratchy dry brush marks that add sparkles of light and luminosity in your work. And the more textured paper makes that effect so much easier to achieve. Um, it also, when the painting is dry, adds a sense of um, depth and luminosity that, uh, that I just cannot seem to get in uh, more smooth surfaced paper. So here, I'm gonna work in slightly forward of the distant buildings just a hint of the, uh, some of the trees in Central Park that are in the, not the distant distance, but in the mid-ground distance. So again, I don't want too much saturation of color. I don't want too much um, definition in edges. I want these to look far away, but a little bit more colorful. This visually tend to pull them forward of the city beyond and begin to establish some of those depth that I want. I didn't mean to do that, but no worries, that should come right off. Right here, I'm being careful to try not to spill any more paint, but to maintain that area as, uh, as the lightest light. So as these trees begin to come out of the mist toward us. If you see in the real picture, gradually there are more and more trees and things in the foreground. Any details in here are just not important. But I do want that sense of depth. That's what is important. So that's what I'm concentrating on. So I'm adding bits more color and a little bit more, I don't want to say detail, but I'm allowing some, uh, some more paper to show through, some more sparkles of light. And I'm using a little bit less water, a little bit more pigment to imply the trees in Central Park to uh, begin to uh, magically appear. These are not that important in the composition, so I don't wanna go too far or do too much. But I think that's, for now, that's enough. This little handy spray bottle I couldn't paint without. It's one of my most important brushes. But when carefully used, 
it's so helpful in getting um, this kind of effect for uh, edges to uh, become softer, to uh, set up dynamics between wet and wet and more, more edge-based work, and to encourage complementary tones to blend together. It's just uh, an extremely handy tool. So uh, I will come back as that sets. Uh, it's still very wet just now, but I do want, if you look back at my value chart study here, this uh, mid-tonality there is pretty much established, but I want something similar here in terms of tonality, maintaining only the light right, right in the center behind the pavilion. Um, yeah, behind these trees, I want it to stay pretty light too. So I'm gonna, before that dries, I'm gonna brighten some of that up. Yeah, we're okay. This will all be pretty dark as that sets more and can hold an edge. Then I'll put the darkest darks in. So here, coming up to the pavilion is a rocky path by all these beautiful granite stones. Um, so I'll keep this, uh, because it is closer to us, I uh, will use some more warm tones, slightly more color, but I want to keep it in the mid-tone range. Another kind of rule of thumb, not a rule because there really are no rules exactly, but just sometimes it's worth considering that when the eye sees things that are far away, they often tend to become a little hazy uh, and look a little violet, a little blue as they're far away. So a little trick I sometimes use, I mean, again, it's not a rule, it's just it's a little trick you can use, is if you make elements that are more in the foreground a bit warmer, and allow elements that are in the background to become cooler. A thousand examples of exceptions I can think as I'm saying this, but that's just a trick you can play and think about. So I'm uh, just dry brushing without too much water, just some tone on this scruffy, stony path. To, again, I'm not painting in all these stones, but if you just dry brush in with a flat brush. You can imply so much without literally having to paint it all. And again, what I'm doing is trying to knock back a bit of this pure white here to make that the center of focus. So, so far, so good. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with the look of that. I mean, I don't want to kill all the light. I just want to knock it down so it becomes more of a mid-tone, but also looks a little forward of all of this stuff. And so far, so good. I usually finish my paintings in one sitting, even very large ones, if, if I possibly can. And that's great, but it means you kind of have to pace yourself. Uh, staging areas of the painting at different points. You can see this background is certainly not dry, but the shine has gone off the paper, meaning it's beginning to dry a bit. So that's good. If I want to do a little bit more work on the city and the distance, now's the time, I think, before it gets completely dry. So I'm using pretty washed out tones that I was using before of some cobalt, cobalt blue and some violets and a mid-sized flat brush to just scrape in some shapes of the towers of Manhattan sort of vanishing into the mist beyond. 
So again, the paper below is not dry, but it's dry enough that it holds just a hint of an edge, and then some places it melts in, and that's good. It's a, it's a gamble when you go back into a wet wash if it's gonna to be too wet or too dry, but you know, what have you got to lose? I want the towers of the city to sort of vanish up into the sky so that they don't become, so they look mysterious and also so they don't become too dominant in the, in the composition. Starting to get a little too dry. I don't want too many edges, but I have my little spray bottle to soften any edges that look too hard if I if I think I need to. I think we're okay. Again, it's just the sense of the city. I'm not doing a, a portrait of New York. That would be a different kind of a painting. So I just want a, a sense of these giant metropolis uh, looming up behind this, this idyllic pastoral scene here. Behind the trees, there are loads of buildings. It doesn't really matter. They're going to be partially covered up, but I would like a few of them to just peek through. But I don't want to kill the light there, so that's, that's enough. There's going to be trees all over that area. You'll also notice I'm not worrying about cutting in around this pavilion to try to hold the edge. And that's because I know that this thing is going to be one of the darkest elements in the painting. So when you're painting in values, um, a darker tone layered over a lighter tone will always dominate, and that edge is what matters. It often looks worse if you paint in a lighter tone and try to hold that edge and then paint up to that with a darker edge. It can look very fuzzy and indistinct. It's better to layer one darker wash over a lighter wash, whatever you can do. So down here, I'm gonna to try to do the same sort of flavor in some of these trees to get just a hint more identity. What what I'm also doing, as you might notice, is giving this time to dry a bit so that then I can come in here and do the darkest elements uh, against slightly drier paper to be sure that they'll hold an edge. I'm gonna try to soften that guy up there with a little mist. Uh, otherwise, I'm pretty happy with the city. I think it's fine. I think this could use some slightly uh, more shadowy tones, so I'll use a little, um, a little of the violet, maybe mixed with just a little bit of blue. Don't really need to worry about color too much in here. It's more a story of uh, value, which is just about always the case. We all love color, I do, but I'm also aware that color is so often the question and so rarely the answer. Almost all the problems or issues your painting might have, nine times out of 10 are solved by adjusting the values, not the colors. That is true for me in any case. I shouldn't speak for you guys. But again, I love color, but uh, I think color is one of those things that can sort of beguile us and um, make us ignore the values, which are often much more important. So as these trees come a little forward, I'm just scraping on some deeper, this is a darker warm tone, a Van Dyke brown, to imply some of this tree cover. I'm 
bits of uh, jadeite green as the trees get even nearer still. All the time I'm doing this, I'm, I'm telling myself, don't go too dark there. All of that is not the star of the show, and I don't want it to dominate the painting. But I think it needs to be a slightly richer uh, mid-tone overall. Now at the edge of a flat brush, I'm going to apply some trunks of trees. And then you've probably already guessed, but I'm going to hit this with my water mist bottle in a second and uh, try to encourage all these shapes to run together and hopefully not lose all of their identity, but a little bit. So sometimes a little tip if you're using your spray gun and you don't want to disrupt anything in one area, if you just mask it off like this, and then you can just hit the bottom of that area, then it's pretty easy to protect another area, in this case, whatever's above. So what I was trying to do is this, to maintain a few little sparkles of light to look mysteriously like the heavy forested area of the park, but still look far away and yet a little closer than the city beyond. Yeah, I think it's happening. Here, there are some um, hedges, low ground covers and hedges on top of some of these uh, closer rocks. I'm gonna play these up as a darker shape than they really are and treat them more graphically and compositionally. So they will layer over those trees beyond and hopefully all fit together nicely. They should do. Okay, now, not crazy about those shapes. They look a little awkward. So rather than fix them, I think I'll just soften them. Now, now they don't bother me. A few of these buildings that are closer than those, as this dries more, I will assess whether I think it needs it. But if they do, I may, as the paper dries a bit more, add a bit of tone to get them to pull away from uh, the layer of buildings beyond. But we'll see. It may not need it. It's not a, all that important in any case. These trees that I've largely invented, but are pretty important to my composition, I'm going to lay in next. They're not all going to be quite as dark as what's happening here, but they will be darker to become part of this whole dark diagonal shape that's going to hopefully add the dynamics to this painting of this, this um, toggling between dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, all the way down through the painting. So compositionally, they're important, but I don't want too much really dark going off the page. I'll probably try to crowd more darkness down here near the center of focus. When I paint trees, I usually, of course, it's not always the same, but usually I paint them by as quickly as I can, indicating the areas of leaves and foliage first. And then before that gets a chance to dry, I will come in and add um, the trunks and branches to. The point of that is so that they all blend, melt together, they connect. I'm always looking for, um, in my work, areas of connections. 
we all paint differently and there's no one right or wrong way to do it, I understand, but what I like to see in my work whenever I can is um, a dialogue between all elements where everything is talking to each other. Uh, they may not get along, but they're all speaking together. And um, by that I mean the areas of dark, for example, may not all physically touch, but there'll be a visual connection through. Connections are a big deal, is what I'm trying to say. The same with light. The areas of light in this painting may not all physically touch, but they will be visually connected. So connection is a big deal. I, I'm not a fan of work that I've done that I look at and I think I can see myself painting a little area here, a little se separate area over there, and the painting starts to look uh, fragmented and disparate. I think that's, that's often what a, a photograph can do to us. It can seduce us into falling in love with, you know, the little details here or here or here or back here, and we start to lose the whole big picture. So I think, it, for me, a successful painting is one that understands that, uh, assesses that, interprets that, and gets around it and makes all elements of the painting connect visually, even if they don't in, uh, in um, real world observation. So yeah, I now I'm painting uh, in tones of different shades of green, the foliage on this grouping of trees, keeping the darker tones squeezed more here, slightly lighter tones out there, away from the center. I don't really need to get too picky, but I'm pretty, uh, I'm trying to be pretty careful to, to uh, model the values and keep them where I want them. So again, the darker tones more toward the center of interest and the lighter tones as the painting goes away from us. This is a, a serpentine green, uh, modifying it here and there with some dark, darker jadeite green. Um, little bits of uh, ultra blue and then some um, burnt sienna for s some warm complement highlights. It's another contrast I always do and my colors are always a uh, hopefully successful but an orchestration of uh, complementary tones. Warms, cools, lights, darks. So that's pretty good as far as foliage. I don't want to overdo it and I don't want to wait too long for that to dry. So I want to start to uh, quickly roughen the branches and some of the larger trunks so that they melt into these areas of foliage and everything begins to connect a little bit more successfully. What I'm using for that is some uh, Van Dyke brown dark warm tones, a little small flat brush uh, for the larger trunk areas. I'm just sort of dragging it over everything quite quickly so I get some aeration, dry brush marks through the wet foliage marks so it all looks very organic, I hope, and not overpainted or segmented, but that everything connects. This kind of thing is what I'm going for, where one thing just becomes another thing. I don't know if there's anything in watercolor I love more than that um, effect, or that idea, really, the, 
the idea that one thing can just magically become another thing. I know in all, probably all painting mediums, there's elements of that and you can do it, um, but I don't know of any medium other than watercolor that can so successfully do that, that, that magical thing where one element can become its opposite. Or here, for example, the sky can just become the buildings and the buildings can become the trees. Um, it's great. The, you, as the artist in watercolor, have the ability to, to orchestrate that effect and to play around with that and to have real fun doing that. You can um, incorporate such beautiful and compelling areas of mystery and tension, resolution, all these great topics. So with a smaller round brush, I'm uh, putting in some of the smaller bits of the trees, little thinner trunks, and um, some of the branch work. Trying to do this as quickly as I can, like more like calligraphy than anything else. Um, if I paint these too slow, they'll look, you know, a little tight and fidgety and a little over-considered. So that's all pretty good. I've maintained the light here where I want. I have a nice organic shape that's dark, but not too dark. I think some more value could be worked into uh, this area closer down in. And I think uh, some of these branches in a lighter tone could, could hang out here over. Be slightly more elegant if I can pull that off. Again, these needn't be too dark. But the overall shape of this tree is pretty good. So I'll stick with that. Um, Painting branches is fun. It can go uh, haywire. You can overdo it. So often, like all things, generally a little less is more. I think if you can try to do it without thinking too much, just intuitively make these marks. Don't forget to breathe. They'll almost always look better than if you paint much slower and more methodically. If you can, hold the brush back as far as you can and then lift it off quickly. Some very nice organic shapes going on. That's all right. It probably needs a little bit more, um, a little bit more connection. And again, I think it probably could stand a bit more value right in here. But while it's wet, I can drop in a few more dark tones. Yeah, that's pretty good. These overhanging leaves, I'm going to darken even more. And on this very uh, leading edge up against the lighter sky behind, I'll put in some very deep leaves, almost as highlights, really concentrating on the center of interest.
Okay, now before this dries, I'm going to start to rough in this dark edge of the rocks because I want that to connect to the trees so the trees can just become the rocks. For that, I'm going to use um, a bit more of this deep brown. I'm going to modify it with some blues. Darken it even more, maybe with a little bit of neutral tint. Get pretty dark as we get down here close to the pavilion. The edge I'm going to keep a little bit defined here and there and a little bit scruffy here and there. It's very little water, almost just dry brush, but, but enough so that it'll connect up to the trees beyond. Then uh, some deep blue, which is a beautiful complement to that dark brown. This is uh, French Ultra. This is right out of the tube, neutral tint, pretty darn dark. Just as we get closer into the pavilion, I'm gonna make it the darkest part of the painting really will be right around in here. It's a somewhat indistinct sun angle that I've got, but it's primarily coming from left down from upper left to lower right so there'll be some shadows coming across from left to right a bit work here while it's very wet on just some uh, stronger slightly more defined connections And these big blocky shapes of rocks and trees are going to come down and make, um, I hope, resolve into these more filigreed lines of thin horizontal shadows across the small stony plaza and then connect up to the big rocks on the other side. That looks pretty good. As this dries, I can add some dry brush marks to... Um, Imply some of the more rocky shapes. Just peeking through the shadows. But uh, it does not want, in my opinion, too much detail. As much as I can imply over there rather than absolute state, I'll be happier. There is a figure here I want to include him, but he's, he's not really central. He's just kind of a nice uh, contrasting element, but I just want a, a figure walking out of the shadows. So I don't need to be too careful about the specifics of him or what he's wearing or anything. The only thing here that's needed is to uh, just sop on the bottom of this and just let it dissolve into more neutral tones. So obviously what I'm starting to do is the, the darkest darks of the painting. They're here. They'll be 
I picked up over here and then pulling this diagonal through out of the painting there. And of course they'll be here, which will be the last thing I'll paint. I can see we're actually running out of time. So I, um, I'll keep painting, but we may have to edit out some of this in the center. So I think what I will do is um, stop the video and then just pick it up for the end part when I um, when I wrap up the uh, the center of focus. So what I've done is laid in some of the darks here to set up the dialogue of the darks on this side and highlight my lights in the center. So I did a little bit of work here. I have this uh, figure just very sketchy, but emerging from the shadows as he's walking up the hill. So now all I have to do is wrap up uh, my actual pavilion and then we'll be done. Um, so far so good, the lights established, the midtones are all in, and the um, secondary darkest darks are in, and now the darkest darks here to connect left and right, and then we'll be finished. I have put, as you can probably see, a bit of warm tone under the pavilion, as if to imply some ref reflected light, but not so much because it would be accurate or representational, but just uh, to hopefully give this um, structure a little bit more uh, dimension and depth. It's a very rough hewn wooden structure, so I want to paint it in quick, confident looking brush marks to allow for a lot of this hop and skip, little air holes to show through, um, just to make it look um, lively and um, aerated because the slats of the, um, the roof allow light and air to come through, so uh, it isn't all a solid roof in any case. I'm dropping in little bits of orange, um, ochre, or red here and there, warm tones in any case, to also help enliven it and to imply some of the sparkles of light that may be shining through the, the timbers. The very edge here where it meets the sky and the cityscape beyond, I want it fairly dark and clear. There's a lot of organic material in this, a lot of foliage and trees. So uh, this will be hopefully an effective counterpoint to all of that. Something slightly more structured however rough it is, it is a man-made object. So I want that juxtaposition of this rough hewn man-made object with the more uh, organic nature of the foliage, rocks, and trees on either side. So I'm using a range of colors for this structure, but primarily what I'm going for, as always, is shape and value. The whole thing needs to read as dark, but that doesn't mean it needs to be solid, a solid shape. I want a lot of air, as I say, to look as if and light to be um, peeking through the dark timbers and a few um, contrasting notes here and there of uh, lighter, warmer tones against darker, cooler into the wet and dropping some bright orange to make it look as if some sunlight is bouncing and hopping up and peeking through. I don't need to do too much of that, but just a little will enliven it and give it a, a little bit more life than just a solid dark element. I can 
afford to eat away a little bit more of this light, but it's pretty precious, so I have to be careful. Now over here, the pavilion actually vanishes behind this bank of trees, which is good because um, it kind of enhances the whole story I'm trying to tell of this uh, interweaving of the natural and the man-made world. So here I want it to look a little mysterious so that you really can't tell what's, what, is, what is a tree and what is part of the pavilion. That's good. That's what I want. I want it to sort of become a little mysterious and to vanish within and under the canopy of trees. Yep, that's nice. It has these bent wood uh, supports. I mean, obviously I could choose to ignore them, but I like them. I think they add a nice, uh, a note of man-made but lyrical structure. I'm gonna get fairly dark with these right around the center. Pretty compositionally important so I can afford to go a little bit more specific and a little bit darker. whole series of uprights on either side and I don't mind that there's some uh, dry brush marks here. Um, yeah, I mean the whole nature of this is inf informal and kind of uh, rough hewn as I say and made by hand so this will help sort of enhance that, that feeling I think. They're such beautiful little structures. Um, Central Park was not there in reality. It's one of the great joys of New York. It was designed by humans. Frederick Olmsted, Calvin Vaux did a lot of the bridges and many of these structures. Um, back in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. So the entire idea of Central Park is, is miraculous. It um, was just farmlands. There was no big city around it at the time it was built, but the designers correctly anticipated that there would be. So they, uh, sectioned off this big area of farmland and there's man-made lakes and tunnels and beautiful bridges and and these pastoral structures everywhere and sure enough in time not much time the city grew up all around it and now i really think it's one of the great amazing man-made items in in the world they truly designed nature. It's uh, shocking to be in the middle of Central Park. You would never know you're in the middle of a massive city all around you. But I think without it, Central or New York City would not be as livable a place as, as I think it is. It's a great gathering spot, of course, and great living room in a way of, of uh, the city. Uh, great public service works. So here I'm just uh, polishing up some of these trees that are just next to it to kind of further enhance the weaving of man-made and natural. Um, and yes, the warm tones of the distant supports I think help give this both a little bit of life and also a little bit more dimensionality than it, than it would. The idea is that light is shining in gently from behind the structure and illuminating it from behind. So there might, there might well be some up lights of the inside of the, the ceiling. The 
No need to get too fancy. What else did I do? I did bump up of these buildings in the near distance a little. I'm not sure I needed to, but I think that's fine. I worked a little bit on this guy to make him look very uh, sketch-based, but as if he's walking out of the shadows, coming up to this illuminated, beautiful little pavilion. And I'll draw his friends here waiting. I'll paint them in. They will be backlit in terms of lighting, so they'll be dark in terms of value, but I don't want them to be solid dark in terms of color. So one way to do that is um, to paint them almost as if they're silhouettes. A little bit specific because they're kind of central. So I want them to look a little bit, um, have nice fairly clean edges, at least on the tops of their, of the figures. And in pretty dark tones, this is a um, neutral tint and ultramarine. But before that has a chance to dry, I'm gonna drop some uh, color onto the figures. This is a good way to uh, do figures that are not too close to you. You want them to look overall silhouetted or backlit or dark in a sense but you do wanna add some sense of color. So if you start with a very dark wash and before it dries, just drop in some color, that's some cad red. It implies in this case that this woman, woman is wearing a dark red top, but without having to get too, you know, overly specific or detailed. And then her friend here, I think uh, I'll give him a manganese blue jacket or shirt. Just a little sparkle of color. Again, without getting too picky or too specific. So again, they have some color, some local color, as if little jewel tones, but this is, this is intended, of course, as a very sketch-based, loose painting. So I don't want anything in it to be overly tight. Little bits of detail are appropriate. But overall, the whole painting needs to, to feel lively and uh, joyous, I hope, despite all the dark tones and um, loose and um, not overly fussy. The last thing I need to do is to sort of connect with some ideas of shadows along the ground plane. The figures, left and right. And uh, I think it's appropriate. There might be a shadow off this one upright. I could Im imply a bit of that too. I think it's actually appropriate and it helps advance my story to not really be able to see where the end of this pavilion occurs and the distance happens. It all just gets bleached out in this glorious light from behind. So basically that is it. I will probably do a little bit of touch up work as this dries, but I'm running a bit long in time. so. Uh, call it quits for this. But overall, what I've tried to do, again, is tell a story, not paint a specific thing. I've tried to interpret a specific scene by telling a story about it. So if we go back to our um, reference photos a moment, Sorry, I'm just trying to make slightly more elegant marks in these shadows. I'm not doing a great job. Yeah, it's better. So 
So if we look at our reference, the initial reference photo of this place in Central Park, I mean, it's very obvious to see what I've redesigned. I've obviously made changes here and here, and, and things and objects I've, I've redesigned. But overall, I've redesigned the values that you see in the photograph. I've reimagined them, interpreted them into what I think is a more effective painting than I would have had had I just copied the photograph exactly. So now I think I have a much more uh, lucid sense of depth of a foreground, midground, and background, a much more organized system of values, dark, dark, dark. All the darks connect, but they're lively and I hope a bit luminous with all these different tones reading through the dark. And then the light connects here and here. Primarily it's in the center with the darks cutting through this way, allowing the light to really come alive. And then all the mid-tones acting almost like supporting cast members to uh, advance the story. So I was pretty true to my uh, values composition study. And again, I went far more from this than from the reference photos, which I really didn't look at after I started painting. But I wanna thank you guys for your attention and for hanging with me through this. And um, I hope to see you all again down the road and happy painting. Stay safe out there.